Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep religion out of government. Ask for a free copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, or join us today in our vital work at FFRF.org. Today on Free Thought Matters, we're going to hear from the award winning journalist Jeff Charlotte author of the New York Times bestseller, The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power. Jeff is executive producer of the Netflix documentary series, The Family, based on his groundbreaking investigation. Jeff Charlotte recently spoke at the National Convention of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, where he was interviewed by guest host, Andrew Seidel. So Jeff Charlotte, welcome to Free Thought Matters. Hello, Andrew. Good to be with you. So you wrote a book, and then you wrote another book, and now you've got this Netflix series that is about as perfectly timed as we could hope on all of it on The Family. So tell us what The Family is. The Family is the oldest, I think, uh, arguably the most influential uh, Christian conservative political organization in Washington. And what makes it especially unusual and why some uh, listeners and viewers might not be familiar, familiar with it is it's also the most secretive. Every year it hosts something called the National Prayer Breakfast at which the president speaks, Congress attends, and yet the organization really pretty much until my work denied that it existed despite extensive documentation. Uh, and that was a theological principle for them. They believed as the longtime leader of the organization would preach, they said, he would say, the more invisible you can make your organization, the more influence it will have. So, so, how did, so if it's a shadowy organization, how did you discover it? How did you get involved with it? How did you get this undercover story, so to speak? I was invited to join. <laughs> I, 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 I actually am a member of the family. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, well, you know, sort of in the sort of the bastardized Calvinism in which they embrace, once you're chosen, you're always chosen. So I'm a brother of the family. I'm a bad brother. I'm a very bad brother. Um, but I <laughs> remain somehow chosen. And uh, this goes all the way back to 2001. Um, a, uh, a friend her, uh, asked me to meet with her brother, who had been on a, a promising arc in life, engaged to be married, and, and um, had a career, and so on, and dropped out of it all to move to Washington and, and live with this organization. And although uh, um, this man's actual family, they were conservative Christians, um, this was not what they recognized. And they thought he'd joined a cult. They said, would you meet with him? And I'd known this man for many years. And he says, no, you've got to see it for yourself. And he knew who I was. So it wasn't exactly undercover. He knew sure. who I was. Um, he knew you were writing and interested about writing. And, all, and, and about religion, religion. yeah. Um, uh, he knew that I'm a secular Jew. Um, and that didn't matter. Um, as I would learn to their theologies, because they sort of believe that anyone, as long as you obey the rules, you're in, um, and invited me to come and live with this group of young men. And that's all I knew it was uh, at the time. Very quickly, I began to see the political power gathered. I met uh, former Attorney General Ed Meese. Um, there were senators, there was congressmen, there was foreign heads of state, and uh, I realized it was a bigger story. And, and you call it, uh, I think, a frat house for God was one of the phrases you used, and you, you just used the word brother. Yeah. There, well, there's these there's these great um, actually reenactments yeah, in yeah. in the Netflix series, and I was really struck in the first episode when you're you're tell, they're telling this story about how you uh, were invited in, and there's a leader who comes in and yeah. talks about some of this theology, and he says uh, he tells this story about uh, you know what if somebody raped three little girls, and I, my jaw just just fell down. It's, it was really striking. You want to tell us a little bit? Yeah, that, that's a, a terrific actor named uh, Michael Park, who um, I loved because he plays the villain on Stranger Things. Um, <laughs> the same kind of character, seemingly sort of banal, but mm -hmm. wait a minute, listen to what he's saying. Um, and there, uh, what, that's an actual conversation that took place that was um, a man named David Coe, who was the son of the longtime leader, Doug Coe, and is also a leader in the organization. Um, he is an advisor to congressmen and senators, and this is the kind of advice he is giving them, um, saying, trying to explain King David. Why is King David chosen, right? This idea of chosenness. And the brothers, the brothers in the family, these young men who are being groomed for leadership, they, you know, 
they're mostly decent young, they're human beings. So they say, oh, it's because he was very virtuous, he was great. And uh, David Coe says, no, King David, King David was kind of a monster, actually, when you think about it. Um, he coveted another man's wife, Bathsheba. He arranges to have that man killed, and then he takes Bathsheba by force. Why is this a biblical hero? And the answer is because he's chosen uh, by God. And how do you know he's chosen? Because he's in power. And that was the pivot to bring this into the present. He says to one of the young men, he says, suppose I heard you rape three little girls. What would I think of you? And uh, this young man, being a human being, says, you think I'm terrible. He says, no, 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 it's fine. You're here. You're chosen. And that, that was the jaw drop. That's the jaw, yeah. And that, that, was a sort of the, that was a sort of a frightening moment for me. Yeah. And, and actually it was interesting because it was, a, I think, a frightening moment for some of these other young guys who had imagine. gotten involved. This is not the church they had grown up with. Yeah. And some sort of trust the authority and make that leap into kind of amorality. Some drift away at that mm -hmm. point. Um, uh, but it had, they have the weight of so many powerful figures behind them that, that you think, oh, well, if these important men say this is okay, I guess it is. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that, especially about their theology, because yeah. you do a pretty deep dive into this. Yeah. In, in, and in their world, is is Jesus a sissy in their world? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is not a sissy in their world. Um, the, you know, they grow out of a, a, a whole movement, um, goes back to the 19th century, of muscular Christianity. Um, and, you know, this, and you got to sort of deal with the history of at a point when the United States uh, and, and, and Great Britain uh, are in their very imperial stages, I suppose you might say the United States still is. Um, and, uh, you know, they're worried about what they see as the feminizing effect of church. Okay. Men going to church and learning to turn the other cheek. You can't learn to turn the other cheek if you're supposed to be out there conquering. Um, and out of this came this muscular Christianity, which the family really uh, embraces. I remember there was one leader who came to us and said, Jesus was alive today. He'd probably be a Navy SEAL. Um, <laughs> and you can find this kind of thinking uh, fairly widespread in fundamentalism. Um, the rejection of... The, the rejection of, of, you know, that which is most appealing about the Christ figure, even if you're not a believer, the, you know, the idea of a character or uh, God, if you believe that, who is gentle in all terms. No, this is a war Christ. This is a warrior God. So, so how does that toxically masculine Jesus and, and the idea of being chosen, how does that play into the, the scandals that you see coming out of the family? I mean, you have Mark Sanford, the, the hiking governor, John Ensign. I mean, why don't these scandals matter then to these people? Or is that, that's exactly the answer. Well, yeah, in episode two, we tell the story of, uh, of then Governor Mark Sanford, who um, you know, now is running sort of a, a kind of crazy dark horse primary challenge to Trump. Um, I but think they said one person. Showed one person, right? Event, yeah. Back then, he was a very reasonable presidential prospect. Uh, he was a real contender until he disappears and says he's going on the Appalachian Trail. Literally disappears. Literally disappears. Fell off the map. Um, uh, later, they actually found uh, airport uh, security camera footage of him in his Madras shirt running to catch his plane to Argentina to meet his mistress. And okay, that should be the end of his career because he's a moralist. He's been mm -hmm. he's been basing his appeal on that. And it's not. One of the things that uh, we couldn't include, you know, you, you put as much in the series as you can, um, uh, was his wife, Jenny Sanford's memoir, in which she describes mm -hmm. how the family steered and controlled what was supposed to be their reconciliation. And where she was told by the family uh, and by Governor Sanford that she was not to bring her complaints about his affair to the governor, mm -hmm. because he was chosen for power by God. He had weighty concerns that the family would designate another man to whom she could speak. And that man would carry her concerns. So the conversation would be man to man. How would this, this man and wife reconcile? A man to man conversation. Um, and that her job was to wait. Her job, they even set up a house for her. You wait for when he is ready to return. That's, I mean, I can't think of a better example of toxic masculinity uh, than and, that. And it goes to kind of one of the hearts of the organization. It's built on these man-to-man -man relationships that you were talking about. And it's one of the reasons it allows 
it, the organization be so shadowy because it's just it seems to be these personal relationships above all else, and they're holding that brotherly relationship above the family, about not not the family, their family, their yeah. personal family. Right, right, yeah. Telling right now. Yeah, there really is. You know, an interesting thing is that there was uh, some terrific reporting on the family by the hard Christian right magazine World, mm -hmm. um, which originally responded to my reporting. I think their first coverage of it was saying, well, Jeff Charlotte uh, was, uh, his parents divorced early, and that's why he says these things. <laughs> you know, he's the product of a broken home. But then they started looking into it more, and they're fundamentalists, but they didn't like this idea of Hitler as a metaphor for Christ, right? That wasn't their, their deal. And they did some good follow the money reporting, and they also had access to some political figures that wouldn't speak to me, including some political wives who were very candid and saying, in my husband's life, um, his brothers and the family come first, wow. then our kids, then me. And that's the proper order uh, to things. So this kind of man-to-man, -man, they even call it, their, finan their approach to finances is what they call the man method otherwise known as off the books. <laughs> um, uh, the IRS also has some terms yeah. for the man <laughs> method. But the idea is that there's a, a, a fair amount of money on documented, but there's even more money moving in the sense that, um, Andrew, I like what you're doing. Um, let me loan you my private jet. Or, or would, you know, would a, would a, a loan of $50,000 help out? Yeah. Um, that's the man method. Okay. Well, we are talking with Jeff Charlotte, and we are going to take a short break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about Trump and the family. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website, ffrf.org. Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites, are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the web. It was Melania who figured it out. In a 2016 best-selling campaign book called God's Chaos Candidate, Donald J. Trump and the American Unraveling by a man named Lance Walnow, an evangelical Trump advisor and a student of Coe's, Walnow writes, while watching the evening news with his wife, Melania, they witnessed the escalating violence and riots happening in Baltimore. In that moment, Melania turned to Trump and said, I'm going to resist trying to do a Melania accent, but I want you to imagine it in your head. <laughs> uh, if you run now, you will be president. What? said Trump. He was legitimately shocked by this sudden declaration. I thought you said I was too bright and brash to get elected. <laughs> Melania turned back to the plasma screen and said, something has changed. They are ready for you now. So in the Netflix series, and in real life, I guess, Doug Coe, the, the kind of a spider at the center of this web of relationships, <laughs> dies. Yeah. And if this is based on relationships and man-to-man, -man, what, what's happening? Where, where are they going? Is, is it going to survive? Who stepped into the, the vacuum? Well, in fact, we see a number of the uh, potential new leaders. Uh, Doug Coe was a long time. He was referred to by some as first brother, a man who thought, was thought to be closer to Jesus than anybody else uh, alive. And it was Doug Coe who was most invested in secrecy. So when he dies in 2017, that in, in some ways makes this Netflix documentary possible. Um, because Doug Coe's great strength was he did not need the limelight. He, his vanity did not take that form. Um, but he collected a group of sort of powerful public men, men who liked 
liked <laughs> getting some attention for their work. And we see some of them on camera, like former Congressman Zach Womp, who was sort of now moving into this uh, uh, leadership role. Um, uh, we also see uh, in episode three uh, a man named Doug Burley, uh, former leader of the uh, parachurch ministry Young Life, um, Doug Coe's uh, son-in-law, and uh, the longtime leader of their Russian effort. Um, and in fact, it's Doug Burley who shows up in the affidavit around the Maria Butina spy affair. It was Doug at, Bur the, at the prayer breakfast. at the national prayer breakfast. Yeah. Doug Bur Burley was, uh, it seems, um, uh, opening doors. Yeah. yeah, opening doors at the national prayer breakfast. Um, it was Doug Burley who was actually organizing prayer breakfast in Moscow for Russian business leaders, including the KGB, or not, sorry, not KGB. Um, uh, uh, the new KGB. <laughs> the new KGB, right. Um, uh, new and improved. Um, uh, uh, the, the Russian intelligence asset, uh, Alexander Torshin, um, uh, who then comes to the American prayer breakfast. So Doug Burley is, and he didn't want to speak on camera. He's sort of the old guard and, and uh, kind of a little bit of skullduggery. You see Congressman Zach Womp. Um, there was other uh, men who thought they were in line for leadership, there's a struggle going on in the movement right now. So that's maybe your ray of hope. Yes, right? I think that is a ray of hope. Absolutely. It is. It is. And, and that some of them, in fact, actually want to embrace publicity and transparency, which even if their views remain the same, it makes it easier it makes it easier for organizations like you guys yep. to take them on in court. Exactly. And let's talk a little bit, too, because you mentioned Russia, and that there's this huge international component to the family. I mean, that they are exporting this yeah. and trying to tap into power centers and powerful men in all these other countries around the world. So I'm a lawyer. I do state church separation for a living. And to me, this seems just like a striking constitutional violation. I mean, you've got, it's essentially a shadow State Department that is exporting Christianity. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really is. Um, I remember actually uh, uh, some years ago interviewing uh, then Senator Mark Pryor, who was a very conservative mm -hmm. Democrat from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked him what he'd gotten from his involvement in the family. He says, oh, well, they taught me that the separation of church and state is a myth, that it was never actually intended. An incredibly common view. So in fact, they don't feel that they're violating it. They feel like that was just a kind of a liberal conspiracy all along. That's true, though. Don't they see this as some sort of abuse of power? I mean, isn't that why it's cloaked in the secrecy, or is it, is it really just that theological part? Because it seems like they're doing it on per behind closed yeah. doors on purpose because they know it's wrong. I mean, there's a saying. They have a, a sort of a motto that goes back to their early days. They're going to bring men of power and influence together to make decisions beyond the din of the vox populi, this pretentious little bit of Latin beyond the voice of the people. Yeah, so this, this is fundamentally anti-democratic. Oh, they're explicitly anti-democratic. This is that's not a charge one makes against them. <laughs> I mean, th they would answer yes, yes. I mean, that's where they begin way back in the 1930s um, with the real, they're looking around. They see fascism over here, um, and they see much to admire in that, but they're not exactly that. Um, they see communism over there. They see organizationally much that they actually like in communism, the, the cell organizing structure, and they say democracy. Democracy can't compete. In the 1930s, that was not an uncommon idea. The mm -hmm. democracy was just not going to make it. Um, and so they decide they need sort of a third way, and that this is the third way. What's interesting between 1930s and now is we have come around again to a moment where many different strands of the right are, it's not that they are saying, our version, this is democracy and you're yeah. wrong. They're saying, democracy democracy is no longer adequate, right? Exactly. So many Trump supporters are not saying he's carrying out democracy. He, this is this is after democracy. And, and you've got in there, in the Netflix special, you've got Doug Coe on tape say, talking about how we should look to Stalin and we should look to the Nazis. And this is, this is the kind of power that we can have. I mean, it, it, it's stunning to, to hear that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting history with that. When I first reported that, Hitler, Lenin, and Mao is a sort of the try. He uses this, this is throughout their archives. This is sort of his go-to sermon. When I first reported it, um, some defenders uh, of the family said, oh, you know, you're making that up. Well, then 
someone within the family uh, arranged for us to get videotape of wow. and audio of, of sermons, and there was more documents and so on. So then they pivoted and said, well, it's just a metaphor. And to which you want to say, you know, you don't need to be an atheist to be troubled by the metaphor of Hitler for Christ. How about a lion or a lamb? There's plenty of good metaphors on, on him. Um, and what that metaphor is, it is, it is the anti-democratic metaphor. It is the idea that what is most, what you're going to take most from those Christian teachings is an idea of power and strength. And it's not that Ko is a Nazi. He's certainly not a Maoist or a communist. Um, uh, but he does fetishize authoritarianism. And he saw that play out around the world with their embrace of dictators until finally, in Donald Trump, such a figure rises right here at home in the United States. And that's what I want to talk about next. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Trump, and you, you, there's this big, there is another metaphor they use, or maybe it's a yeah. parable, it's, it's the, the Wolf King. Yeah. And you lead up to this in the series brilliantly, I think. Uh, can, you, can you explain that, the Wolf King, for everybody? So the Wolf King, I mean, this was a, uh, when I was uh, uh, living amongst them, and then later in their documents, I would often find this rhetoric of, you know, most of the church cares for the sheep, but who's caring for the wolves, the <laughs> poor wolves? We are, right? Um, but then it goes a little bit further, and this was actually, uh, as I was trying, in 2016, I was trying to understand um, the broad evangelical embrace of, of Trump. It wasn't surprising to me that the family could embrace Trump, right? They can cut a deal with anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but the broad embrace, where, where people usually, uh, fundamentalists wanted piety in their candidates. Well, Trump wasn't going to give you that. Um, and I found in the writings of uh, one of Trump's advisors, Lance Wallnow, mm -hmm. he says, look, the way I came to understand this is I went to uh, my Washington friend. His Washington friend is Doug Coe. And he explained to me the, the sheep and the wolves. But he took it a little bit further. He said that um, uh, the way this is, is you go to the wolf pack and you look for the strongest wolf in the pack. That's the one you want. And you go to that, it's the king of the wolves. King of the wolves, yeah. And you go to that wolf king and you say, I come representing this other king, Jesus. And what if I was able to bring that power alongside your power? You don't have to love Jesus, you just want that power. Let's make a deal. Um, and so that's the Wolf King. And, and that's speaking Trump's language, let's make a deal, that's what he's about. So, so yeah. Trump is the Wolf King in, in there. Trump, the, Trump is the Wolf King and they have embraced Trump, yeah. I mean, there's, there's I, I should say, I should say, uh, to be careful, um, this is not a rigid organization. It's, a, it's best understood, in fact, as a social movement with a more tightly wound core than, than they like to acknowledge. But you'll find members within it, Mark Sanford, who are obviously not uh, Trumpers. Um, we're willing to talk about it, too. Yeah. yeah, well, he's, he won't talk about his involvement with the family. I mean, to but, be openly yeah. anti-Trump, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the question that I ha continually had when I was watching this, and you're talking about this theology and this, this reversal of the, the typical understanding of Christianity, maybe, is, is this all in the pursuit of power, or do they actually believe it? It's kind of a question that we, we often think about with the, the mega preachers. You know, do they believe what they're actually saying, or are they just in it for the money? Are they just in it for the power? Do you have any idea? Uh, the answer to both questions is yes. <laughs> and, and I, I really, actually, I think, I think that is, um, that, for those of us concerned about those abuses of power and the separation of church and state, the ability to recognize that both these things can be true at once is going to be absolutely essential for us pushing back. Because if we keep going toward, as, as I think it's tempting for us to do, oh, it's just cynical, it's just hypocritical, yeah. and so on, we underestimate, we greatly underestimate the strength of that movement. Um, uh, and on the other hand, if we do that thing that too many in the established press do and say, well, they're sincere, so what could be wrong? Mm -hmm. um, and there was actually a review with the family. Someone sort of said, but these guys seem to really believe it. So yeah. that also does not mean that it's okay. Um, uh, a sincerity is not an excuse, and cynicism uh, and hypocrisy is not a full explanation. Um, the enduring power of this movement, I believe, and not just the family, but Christian nationalism writ large, mm -hmm. Um, is its ability to simultaneously be both cynical and naive. One or the other, you can knock it out easily. Both 
has a has a, a, a force that carries it forward. That is a fascinating answer that I'm going to be thinking about yeah. for a long time. Now, you are not really doing that much more work in terms of investigating the family, right? I mean, you've you've written, <laughs> you, you've done a whole lot. You've yeah. carried, I mean, yeah. you've carried the yeah. ball the entire yeah. way. Nobody yeah. else has been helping you. There, there have been other, I mean, actually in the series, we saw um, Lisa Getter, a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the LA Times, who before me did a front page expose for the LA Times. I mean, one of the interesting things about the family is I'm not the first to report on this. Okay. Before me, there's Lisa Getter in 2002. She actually came down and was reporting while I was living with them. And then I sat with Ed Meese as he led a special prayer against the evil of the media because she had <laughs> done this. Terrific expose that should have made waves before her, um, uh, um, the AP had looked at their violation of, of rules. You go back to the 70s, Playboy magazine does a big expose. Um, uh, uh, I think it's Robert Shear, legendary uh, oh, yeah. investigative yeah. journalist, on the way the family is operating operating as an illegal off-the-banks book for members of Congress. That should have shut it down. You got back, back, 1950s, Washington Post. Again and again and again, we see it, and there's just, it doesn't fit within the mold of what we think the Christian right is supposed to be, so it never quite takes. You know, one of the, my, my favorite line that summed it up for me was, there was actually, it showed your notebook, and then there's a, <laughs> it's highlighted and said, this is not America. <laughs> I loved it. And we're gonna have to leave it there. Jeff Charlotte, thank you so much for joining us on Free Thought Matters. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters, because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.